Well, especially for those of you who are visiting with us, let me just catch you up a little bit. We've been in a series called All In. Maybe you've seen a couple of t-shirts this morning that say All In. Uh, If you're on social media, you may have seen some selfies posted a few weeks ago uh, that say All In. Uh, But what we're doing with this is we're going through the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, which are both written by Luke. And basically we're just looking at stories. We're looking at some of the narrative passages that help us understand the gospel uh, in a better way. And this morning's uh, story especially is gonna show us really the power of the gospel. Now by gospel, we just mean good news. It's the good news of Jesus. And so we're excited to share that. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts is in the the New Testament. You got four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you run into this history book uh, called the book of Acts. Once again, also that that Luke wrote. It's really the history of the spread of the church. It starts after Jesus ascended to heaven, and then you see the disciples getting together and the Holy Spirit coming, and then churches being planted all over the place and missionary journeys. It's got some great stories uh, in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, uh, hopefully if you don't have a Bible, you're close enough to look on with someone or look at their phone or something that works. Um, But we're excited about sharing this particular story about a Roman centurion named Cornelius and how he came to experience the power of the gospel. And there's a theme we're going to see through this, by the way, that the gospel changes everything. And we're going to see that in a special way as we go through this, this particular story. So before we jump into this, let's just pause and uh, come before the Lord in prayer and just thank him for the privilege we have to come together and spend some time in his word in a free and public setting. And by the way, I also need to say this. Some of you, just by the size of the crowd, some of you probably had to park like at the Walmart to get here this morning. <laughs> so for those of you that parked like eight miles away and made the walk, hey, thank you especially uh, for, for making that journey <laughs> this morning. So let's pray together. Father God, thank you that we can come together in your name, united by your spirit, look at the truth of the gospel, the good news of what you did for us through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we are grateful people today We are grateful people because we understand that everything we have comes from you, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Every bit of spiritual insight we have comes from the Spirit. The forgiveness of our sin we have because of what Jesus did on the cross. And we are just here as grateful recipients of your goodness in our lives. Father, thank you that you're not stingy with your grace, but that you lavish your grace upon us and that we can just bask in your goodness and in your beauty and in your love this morning. Father, as we look at the story of Cornelius, I pray that you will open our hearts and open our minds uh, to what you want to say to us through your word, that you would give us a good understanding of who you are and what you have done for us. So we surrender this time to you and ask for you to speak to us in, in powerful ways this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this story is an important one. Uh, Cornelius, as I mentioned, was a Roman centurion. Centurion isn't a word that we use anymore. Centurion is part of, it's a position, almost like a captain in the Roman army. He was a guy that that had command over a hundred soldiers. And he lived in Caesarea, which was kind of a stronghold of the the Roman uh, military. It's a significant story. It it takes up the entire chapter of chapter 10. It's retold in chapter 11. It shows up again in chapter 15. This this is an important story. Now, it does take up the whole chapter. And I I hope you have a Bible close to you because I'm not going to read most of it verse for verse. I'm going to kind of tell you the story. And then towards the end, we're going to start reading some of the scripture together. But we see from the very beginning that as we're introduced to Cornelius, that he was a good man. He's described this way, that he's a devout man and that he feared God, that he gave generously to the poor and that he prayed consistently. And we look, everything about Cornelius says this is a good guy. He's a good man. But we also see as we dig a little deeper that he was a good man, but that there was something missing. You see, in that culture, there was actually a group of people called God-fearers, people that feared God, but they were kind of outside of the assembly. 
They would sometimes come to the synagogues, but they would have to stand along the edge or maybe even outside the window. They loved hearing the word taught, but they did not convert to Judaism. Now, to convert to Judaism means submitting to the law of Moses, which includes things like being circumcised, submitting to the, the dietary law, which would mean that, you know, as we have pizza later, no pepperoni pizza or no sausage pizza for you. And, but there were people who feared God, but did not fully convert to Judaism. And, and Cornelius was probably one of those guys. So he would kind of seek God, be interested in God, but he's always on the outside looking in. Well, we're gonna see as we go through this chapter that God takes extraordinary measures to move Cornelius from outside the assembly to inside the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, the extraordinary measures begin very early in the chapter. It says that Cornelius is praying. It says the ninth hour of the day. That's three o'clock in the afternoon. It was a designated time for prayer. And here's Cornelius praying, and God does something dramatic to capture his attention. He sends an angel. If you can imagine, you're sitting there praying, God, thanks for the day, bless the missionaries. And then there's an angel. And we read that Cornelius was terrified. Yeah, I would be too, right? And he's terrified. And the angel starts talking to him. And here's what he says. He says, I want you to send people to Joppa. And I want you to go to the house of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. And for some reason, he's always described in that way, Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. So we'll keep saying that, okay? So go to Joppa, to the house of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea, and there's going to be a guy there named Simon Peter. Have him come to your house. So he did. That's exactly what he did. But I want to pause here for a second. This is God doing something extraordinary to capture his attention. And don't miss this either. God wants to communicate the gospel to Cornelius. And he sends an angel. But you notice what doesn't happen. It's not the angel who communicates the gospel. And angels would be far better communicators of the gospel, right, than, than people like you and me. But notice this is God's plan. God's plan is not that angels are going to show up and share the gospel. The, God's plan is that Christ followers, ordinary people, will be sharing the gospel. Now, we hear from missionaries in Middle Eastern nations, more Muslim nations, that God is still doing this, by the way. That there are people having dreams and visions about people saying, go to this man or this woman who will explain spiritual truth to you. And it's the same thing in these dreams and visions. God isn't explaining the gospel. He's directing them to people who will explain the gospel. So the angel disappears. Cornelius does what probably we would do if an angel showed up before us. He did what the angel instructed him. He took two of his servants and one of his soldiers, and he sent them to Joppa, to the house of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. He's very proud of that beachfront property, apparently. Joppa. You, you might have heard of Joppa. Maybe not. It shows up in the Old Testament, in the most random place. You see, there, there, there's, a, there's a book in the Old Testament called Jonah. Maybe you're familiar with the story of Jonah. But God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah wants nothing to do with Nineveh. So he goes the opposite direction. And he goes the opposite direction by going to a little port town called Joppa and getting on a ship and going the other way. So God wants to make sure that Peter doesn't do that. So God takes extraordinary measures to bring the gospel to Cornelius. But he also takes extraordinary measures to get a hold of Peter. Here's what I mean. This chapter is about the conversion of Cornelius. But there's also a conversion that needs to take place in Peter and in the early church. Now we see God working in extraordinary ways, not only in angels and visions, but also in the timing of things. Because as these men leave Caesarea on the way to Joppa, it's about 30 miles. As they're approaching Joppa, it's lunchtime in Joppa. 
at the house of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. And so as they're getting lunch ready, Peter says, I'm gonna go up on the roof to pray. Now, some of you may think that's an odd place to go pray. I pray in cemeteries and that creeps people out sometimes. That's odd, I will admit that. But in that culture, going to the rooftop to pray was very common. A lot of times they had flat roofs and it was almost like another living area. So Peter climbs up on the roof, he's getting away from the hustle and bustle of, of the food preparation and he begins to pray. And God does once again the extraordinary. As Peter's praying, he has a vision. And it's a vision of this sheet coming down from heaven and it opens up and inside this sheet, there are animals, all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds. And Peter looks at this wondering what's going on and a voice from heaven says, arise Peter, kill and eat. Well, I think Peter thinks this is some kind of test. So he says, oh, you're not gonna get me on that one. By no means, Lord, I have never eaten that which is common or unclean. Well, then he hears this rebuke. What I've called clean, don't you call unclean. And then this vision repeats itself. Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Oh, by no means, Lord. I have never eaten stuff that's unclean. Hey, what I've called clean, don't you call unclean. And then the third time, Peter, kill, eat, by no means. What I've called clean, don't you call unclean. And then it disappeared. And Peter's sitting on the roof thinking, what in the world did this mean? He's trying to figure out the meaning behind this, this vision. And I told you, you know, the timings with the story, not just mere coincidence. As his vision ended and Peter is sitting there scratching his head, thinking, what in the world does this mean? These three men from Caesarea show up at the gate and they're looking at their Waze app and said, this is exactly what time they said I would get here. And they make their way to the house of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea and they yell out, is there anyone here named Peter? Peter's on the roof right then thinking, what in the world does this vision mean? And they go on to explain that an angel appeared to Cornelius and sent us to get you. And Peter's thinking, I just had this vision about not calling unclean what God has called clean. On top of that, the spirit of God speaks to Peter and says, go with these men. God's doing extraordinary things to get the gospel to Cornelius and for Peter to rethink some things in his own life. You know, I pick on Simon the Tanner. Let me just back up and say this. When we think about a tanner who lives by the sea, we may be thinking of the tanners that we see when we go to the beach, right? People that are just working on their tan because they live by the sea. Well, a tanner uh, is not someone who works on their tan, as most of you know. A tanner is someone who takes hides, skins of dead animals, and he makes things out of leather. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a tannery. I had the privilege of going to one in Morocco one time, and you will never quite get over the smell of being, it's dead animal skins, it's the, the, the stinky dye, it, it's everything kind of coming together. Just to, This was not a pleasant place uh, for Peter to be staying. It's not the, the beachfront property that we think of in Laguna or something, okay? This is, this is where he is. And God's trying to get a hold of him. You see that they lived by this tradition. And it's interesting when you start thinking about this tradition, it was that God is calling us to be clean. And, and, and we are clean based on obedience to the law of Moses. And we are not to associate with that which is unclean. And so when we meet someone who is uncircumcised, we, we don't go into their house. Or someone who, who doesn't live by the dietary law of the Old Testament, we don't sit down and eat with them. And there's something about eating with people that was so intimate. You're really crossing a line when you eat with them. And if you remember, that's what they accused Jesus of, that you eat with tax collectors and sinners. And as a good Jew, even a good Jewish Christian, you would not go into the house of Gentiles, much less eat with Gentiles, people that weren't Jewish. 
Now, it's interesting, this teaching doesn't really come from the Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament talks about it is through Abraham that all the nations will be blessed. And as you get into Isaiah, there's, there's prophecies of a future time when all nations, even enemies of Israel, will become worshipers of God. But in some of the rabbinical schools of that time, they would emphasize so much that we need to be separate and we need to be clean that they remove themselves from relationship with Gentiles. You're going to see in here the gospel changes everything. Even confronts churches or church leaders who hold to traditions that when you take a look at it, they're not in line with the gospel. And this is what's happening from the very beginning. And all of this is based on the gospel. So God has taken extraordinary measures on one hand to say, Cornelius, you need to come from the outside looking in to being part of the body of Christ. He's also saying, Peter and other church leaders, you need to understand this separatist attitude is not in line with the gospel. That the kingdom of God is bigger than just the Jewish people. When you said at Pentecost, when you quoted Joel 2, in your sermon and said that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. It didn't just mean all Jewish flesh. That I'm doing a great work bringing Jews and Gentiles together as one body, the body of Christ. Well, they start this journey. Having heard that an angel showed up to speak to Cornelius and having seen the vision from God and the spirit saying, yes, go with these men. Peter took six of his friends that were also Jewish Christians and he joined these three. So six plus three plus one, 10 of them made the trip, the 30 mile journey from Joppa to Caesarea. By the time they got there, it had been four days since the angel appeared to Cornelius. Now Cornelius was smart. Do you know what he did in those four days? This was great. See, he knew because an angel had told him to do this. He knew that a man of God was gonna come and speak spiritual truth. Now he didn't want this to happen like one-on-one -on -one sitting over coffee. He's like, I've got a man of God coming to share God's word. So he gathers his family, he gathers his friends. Listen, this is the original friend Sunday happening right here. Now I don't know if it was a Sunday, but I do know that he invited his friends. And I hope those of you that were invited this week kind of pick up on some of this because there's a truth in God's word that we're excited to hear, but we don't want to keep it to ourselves. We want others to hear the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ. And so it only makes sense that we would invite people to come join us in hearing this gospel, this good news of Jesus. And so when Peter shows up with these nine other people, they walk into a full house. And honestly, there's some socially awkward things that happen when he get there. For example, when he comes, Cornelius comes and he bows down before him. And Peter basically says, get up. I'm not the one you worship. I'm just the guy that honestly didn't even want to come, but God made me and here I am. He says, get up. And then Peter, as he walks into the house, now, now just listen to this and see if there's anything, if this just sounds a little socially rude to you, kind of a faux pas. Before he enters the house, he says, I want you all to know something. You all know that as a Jew, I'm not supposed to come into this dirty house. But God told me it's okay, so I'm gonna come in the house. <laughs> that sounds a little awkward, doesn't it? He didn't say dirty house, I added that in. <laughs> but that's what he meant. I thought this house was unclean, so I would never walk into this house but God sent me. And I want to pick up in the reading at that point. We're going to skip way down to verse 33. And when you get down to verse 33, this is Cornelius speaking. He says, so I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Is this a great way to assemble to hear God's word? That we are here in the presence of God, eager to hear what God has laid on your heart to share. Now I've said so far, the gospel changes everything. The gospel is gonna change Cornelius. The gospel is gonna change Peter and the early church. But what we haven't done yet is said what the gospel is. And so Peter walks into this packed house full of the, the family and friends of Cornelius. 
and he begins to speak the gospel. Now, what we read, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is kind of giving us the highlights, kind of like the outline of the sermon. I guarantee you Peter spoke longer than the two minutes it would take to read these verses. So he's kind of giving us the outline. And let's walk through and look at the outline of what he said. Verse 34, so Peter opened his mouth. So truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Let me just pause there, Lord of all. Do you remember what God was known as in the Old Testament? He's the God of Israel. But instead of coming in to this Gentile context and talking about the God of Israel, he says, Jesus is not coming as the God of Israel. He's the Lord of all. Then we keep reading, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him, and we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. He starts off by saying, look at the life of Jesus. What we see in Jesus was a good man. He did good things but not only a good man, a good man that walked with the power of God. He healed people who were sick. He had authority over demons. As a matter of fact, what you saw in Jesus, his life, his teaching, his power, this should have been enough for you to say, this is God and I believe. But instead of that response, look what we read next. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. Now, once again, we're just getting the outline here. It's interesting that he says hanging him on a tree because in the Old Testament, we read that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And my gut feeling is that as Peter is explaining this, he talks about Jesus hung on the tree. He took the curse that our sins deserve. And Jesus was hanging on the tree, experiencing the full wrath of God that our sins deserve. He's not just a guy that died. He is a substitute for those who believe. That each of us are guilty because of our sin. And the price that our sin demands is the full wrath of God. But that was poured out not on us, it was poured out on Jesus that he took on the curse so that we could experience the blessing of God. Well, that's not the end though. But God raised him up on the third day and he made him to appear not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. See, not only did Jesus die on the cross, three days later, He was resurrected, and in doing so, he accomplished victory over sin and victory over death itself. So as Peter's explaining the gospel, he says, look at the life of Jesus. Look at the power, the spiritual power. He was God. He's Lord of all. And he died in our place, and then he was resurrected. And Peter's saying, I'm standing here as a witness. He didn't appear to everybody, but we know he showed up to over 500 people at one time and that he ate and he drank. This is real. This is not a myth. This is not a legend. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And then as we keep going, and he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Understand this, the the story of Jesus does not end with the resurrection because After the resurrection, Jesus ascended to the Father and was exalted to the highest place, to the right hand of God where he reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is the one who is the judge of the living and the dead. I mean, we can't end the story of the gospel with with just the empty tomb because look what Jesus is doing now. He's reigning at the right hand of the Father. And then he goes on to say from there, to him, all the prophets bear witness. I love this. All these things that have happened, the life of Jesus, the crucifixion, the resurrection, 
the exaltation to the right hand of God. All of these things are in fulfillment of what the Old Testament prophets said. And you see in the New Testament, so many references back to the prophets. It's a way of saying, if you really understood the Old Testament, you would see that they were talking about Jesus, who has fulfilled all that the prophets have said. And the prophets also said this, that in that day, as we keep reading, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. I mean, that's the gospel. It's the truth of what Jesus did, that Jesus lived the perfect life, was crucified, was, was resurrected, ascended, and is exalted at the right hand of the Father. But it is a gospel that demands a response. It responds us saying, yes, we believe. We put our faith in what Jesus has done. And this is what happened. I mean, let's look in the next few verses, we see the response to this message and it starts with them saying, yes, we believe. And we know that they believe because of what happens next. This, and this once again, remember, God's going to extraordinary measures here to change Cornelius and to change the church. While Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with the other Jews who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on Gentiles for they were hearing them speak in tongues and other languages and extolling God. Now this, this is a place to pause for a little bit of explanation. Not everybody who puts their faith in Jesus responds by speaking in tongues. The chapter before this, chapter nine, Saul, who became known as Paul, had a conversion experience and did not respond by speaking in tongues. The chapter four, before that, there's an Ethiopian official who puts his faith in Jesus. He did not immediately start speaking in tongues. God was doing something extraordinary in Cornelius's house. And this is, this is what he's doing because they came in thinking, I cannot even walk in this house and be pleasing to God. And God's taking extraordinary measures for these Jewish Christians to understand that the same spirit that was given to you has now been given to the Gentiles, that God's doing something bigger than what you ever imagined. And don't miss the next part. And they were extolling or worshiping God. They believed they received the Holy Spirit and they were worshiping. And please do not miss this. Here's Cornelius, right? The guy standing outside the synagogue. The guy always an arm's length away. The guy who feared God is now the guy who is forgiven by God and he has entered the assembly of people that are worshipers of the risen Christ and the living God. The gospel changed everything. He heard this message, he believed this message, and he's moved from being the guy outside the assembly to the guy who's a worshiper of the living God. Let's keep reading, because it just, it, you know, every verse just keeps getting better. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So notice the response, and then Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. They believed the gospel. They received the Holy Spirit. They became worshipers of God. They were baptized. And then we look one final thing. Didn't they ask him to remain for some days? They wanted to hear more. Well, th this is rich. This is life-changing stuff. Will you, will you stay a few more days and tell us more? They wanted more. Now we have every reason to believe that Peter and these six other Jewish believers stayed. Do you see what's happened by the time you get to the end of the chapter? The gospel has changed everything. That Cornelius, who is an outsider, is now forgiven and part of the body of Christ. Peter, don't miss this. Peter, who had no problems staying with the man who constantly handled dead flesh, but thought it was unclean to walk into the house of a Gentile, has now had his own conversion that what God is doing is bigger than just reaching the Jewish believers. This kingdom of God is going to the Jews and the Gentiles. 
But I want you to notice one other thing. They stayed a few more days together in the same house. I would imagine they were worshiping God, spending time in scripture, learning more, enjoying fellowship together, eating together. Actually, chapter 11 begins with Peter being accused. You went in the house and ate with uncircumcised Gentiles. And he said, yes, I did. You won't believe what God is doing. But I have a feeling that as they spent time together, they stopped being Jews and Gentiles. And they became brothers and sisters in Christ. Because you see, the gospel has a way not only of bringing people into the kingdom of God and challenging traditions of the church that are not in agreement with God's word. The gospel also has a way of just destroying barriers that we erect between people. Now, we have just come through one of the most divisive and ugly presidential campaigns, and certainly I can remember. The good news about Tuesday is that it'll be over. The bad news about Wednesday is that one of these choices will be our next president. <laughs> but I love what Rob said, God's still on the throne, <laughs> right? And I look at seasons like this, and it seems like every four years our country seems more divided than we were four years ago. Is it just me? Or do you notice? And you start thinking, can anybody ever bring us together? And it would be a masterful politician to be able to, to bring everybody together. And I'm highly skeptical, I'll be honest with you, of that happening. But here's what I do see in the gospel. I do see in the gospel that God brings together people who have radical differences outside of the gospel, but we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's within the kingdom of God that ethnicity doesn't matter. How much money you have doesn't matter. Male or female, it doesn't matter. There's a great verse in, in Galatians that says there is, therefore, no longer male and female. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. There's no longer, it says barbarian or Scythian, if you want to figure that out. But we are all one in Christ. And this is what the gospel does. That people who would not walk into each other's home at the beginning of the chapter are now coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ, centered around God's word and around the worship of the living God, which, by the way, is just a foretaste of what's going to come. Because you get to the end of the book and you know what you read? You see that people from every nation and tribe and language, all these people with all these ethnicities, and I'm convinced there's going to be both Republicans and Democrats that are there together worshiping God, crying out in one voice, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the lamb that was slain because the kingdom of God is bigger than political parties and ethnicities and skin color and socioeconomic levels. The kingdom of God's bigger than that. And, and this is the power of the gospel. And the gospel changes everything. Look what happened from the beginning of chapter 10 to the end of chapter 10. Cornelius feared God but was an outsider, is now a worshiper of God and forgiven. Peter, who understood the gospel but held to this tradition that we don't associate with Gentiles, he was changed by the power of the gospel. And this barrier between Jews and Gentiles was utterly destroyed because the gospel changes everything. And so we need to wrestle with, have I responded to the gospel in my own life? Or if I have, am I allowing some of these divisions to, to stand, these barriers that need to be shattered by the gospel? Do, do I need to deal with some of this in my own heart and life? And, and the message from the Lord is very simple. <laughs> that because of the message of the gospel, the life, death, resurrection, exaltation of Jesus, all in fulfillment of scripture, that there's hope 
to bring you into the family of God and to bring us together as one people. So this morning, not sure why you came. The pizza will be good. I hope that's part of why you came. But I also hope that you hear this simple message, that God loves you more than you could ever realize. And even though our sin has declared us guilty, Christ died in your place and in my place so that we can move from being outside the assembly to part of the family, the kingdom of God, the body of Christ. And it begins with just saying yes to Jesus. So let's pause together and pray. Father God, I thank you for what you are doing within us. I thank you for the power of the gospel. I thank you that the gospel changes everything. Father, I think back to my life as being kind of like Cornelius, a good, a good kid. I did a lot of right things, but I was also on the outside looking in because I had never really responded to the gospel. I thank you for doing that in my life, showing me that it's, it's not just about being good, but it's about trusting Jesus. And Father, if there are people that you have brought here today, people that we gathered and said, here we are in God's presence, eager to hear what you have to say to us. Father, if there's someone that maybe you're nudging in their heart that they need to take that step of receiving you. Father, would you give them the courage just in the quietness of this moment to come before you and pray something like, Father God, I know that I have sinned and I need to be forgiven. And I believe that Jesus died in my place and rose again on the third day to pay for my sins so that I can find forgiveness in you. Father, will you forgive me? Will you save me? Will you help me to live for you? Father, we know from your word that when we say, it's not, it's not the words we say, but when we really put our faith in what Jesus did, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, and I thank you for that. Father, we just want to declare our love for you and how much we long for that day when all of the things that divide us as people are melted away into the worship of the risen Christ and the living God. As we read it at the very end of scripture, even so Jesus come quickly. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.